Welcome back to our course, Strategic Technological Forecasting. And today we are going to discuss about um, logistic S-curve, in particular in context of quantitative forecasting. So, today we are going to see uh, what are the logistic S-curve model and how can we use them. Uh, for technological forecasting. We are going to also see some examples about logistic substitution model, which is essentially a kind of extension of using logistic S-curve. And we can see advantages and limitation of uh, those models and uh, technology forecasting by itself in order of strategic decision making. But let us start uh, gradually. First of all, let us see uh, what are uh, the area of application of quantitative forecasting. We use quantitative forecasting when we uh, have numerical information about the past, and this is and this is very important because if you have no uh, this data uh, to use quantitative model is not possible. The second, when it is reasonable to assume that some aspects of the past patterns will continue into the future. What does it mean? It means that uh, when we have a data and we have uh, our basic assumption that the patterns that we can learn from those data uh, will continue in the future, we can use uh, those patterns for the forecasting. And the third uh, limitations when we can use quantitative uh, forecasting, it is when forecasting uh, an existing on the market uh, technology. I mean, uh, the technology already exists on the market. And this is, uh, this is kind of contradictory requirements for forecasting emerging technologies. And we are going to discuss how we can by, um, bypass and resolve this contradiction. Because from one point of view, we, we are mostly interested to predict emergent technology uh, evolution and diffusion. But uh, to have a data, we can have a data just from the uh, technology which already exists on the market. Well. What kind of data do we apply? What kind of data we can apply uh, for the forecasting? We can split all data by two big categories. The first one is the time series data. This is a uh, data which are collected at the regular intervals of the time. For instance, if we have a, a number of unique visitors on Amazon Prime Video in India, and this is real data, just part of the data which is extracted uh, from a source of the data that you can find at the bottom side of this slide. We have a monthly extraction of number of visitors. Those kind of data we name time series data because after the regular intervals, we have a data which show us uh, certain information. Another kind of data which is applied for quantitative uh, study, and it can be applied also for, for the forecast, this is a cross-sectional data. This kind of data is collected by observing several subjects at one point of a period of time. For instance, if I just show you the example, quite about similar topic, the video consumption across India for the fixed period of time in July 2018. And this data represent by types and uh, generation. For instance, who is watching break, uh, cable TV and who is uh, watching uh, content online and divided by generation. So those kind of data is also 
interesting and useful, but in our case, for the forecasting, we mostly use the time series data. And the logistic S curve model that we are going to uh, see today together, they are based on using this kind of data, time series data. You know, when we have a collection of the information, our uh, regular intervals, our time. Well, what kind of data do we apply? For strategic forecasting and technological changes, uh, we are looking for uh, future data. In fact, what we are interested to know, we are interested to know, for instance, what will be in the future number of customers of uh, Amazon Prime Video in India. So for this, for this purpose, in order to answer such a question, we are, we are using time series data. We take available data, we use extrapolation technique using different functions, and we can predict, for instance, in 2022, how many these customers will be based on the pattern that we learn from the past data. If I take this method in very, in very general, for instance, uh, this is a fitting of curve. You can see on, on this slide, the data over the long period of time about sunspot. This is a, a interesting uh, data for the scientific, uh, for scientists in order to study magnetic activities of the sun. And you can see in the yellow, this is a daily data, how many suns, uh, sunspots were observed, okay? We can see also the blue line, this is a monthly average of sunspots. And what we are doing by fitting curves, we are trying to find the mathematical expression, the red one, which will explain these fluctuations, these changes over the time. And based on this mathematical expression, based on the pattern that we learned from the past data, we can predict the future number of sunspots. Why it is interesting to know, because in fact, the magnetic activities of sun can have a lot of impact on the technologies on the earth, like uh, mobile communication, uh, like you know navigation system, and other systems that are mostly based on using electric current and electromagnetic fields. So that's why uh, those kind of forecast, this is very important as, as a forecast, for instance, the weather forecast, the hurricane or earthquake forecast. Well, uh, the, on this slide, I would like uh, to discuss uh, the basic, very basic principle. We take data, time series data, and we try to find the pattern. Okay, this is a very general method, which is on the basis of what we are going to do with logistic escrow. The idea is to generalize. Yes, please, do you have a question? Um, uh, I have a question on uh, the modeling of this data itself. So we have a, a plot along with the data. Mm -hmm. uh, now the question is uh, uh, often what uh, theoreticians versus experimenters uh, battle with, right? So um, do we start with theory and then see if it fits the data or do we take data, fit a model and uh, see if it, uh, can we generate a model? What, what do you recommend uh, when it comes to uh, looking at data like this? Yeah, in fact, first we take a data, we try to uh, conclude the model out of the data. And of course, after we start to use a model, we try to check how our model is close to the reality, okay? In fact, we provide the measurement, we continue to measure, 
the real uh, situation and we see how our model uh, corresponds to uh, to what what we predict and this is and this is exactly uh, we are going to see with our logistic s curve because uh, when we are using logistic s curve we already take the mathematical function what we are looking with logistic s curve we try to see what will be um, the parameters of this function let's us see uh, together uh, starting from uh, three different way to fit the data the simplest way to fit the data this is a linear function okay we can try to take the, the data points and try to see what are the linear function that can uh, predict the future output the best way another way for instance we can take simple function like cubic function and try to fit our data with this function and the most used, for instance, the function, this is exponential growth because it was observed through many uh, kind of different system, biological, technical system, that uh, most of the processes, they start to grow very slowly. At a certain point, certain piloting point, they start to grow very fast. From mathematical point of view, those three function both are interesting, but from real point of view, the exponential growth are most interesting because it uh, corresponds uh, more to the real process observed. But what was also observed, that there is no process, there is no diffusion, uh, there is no any growth which can continue exponentially, uh, infinitely. And more uh, realistic function, more interesting function uh, for the for the practical uh, point of view this is a logistic function which on certain period of time very close to what we can observe with a, a exponential growth but in the logistic function we have a, a the embedded idea that whatever growth we have it is always capped by certain limitation and it becomes from certain point uh, of the in the time the system continue to grow not as fast as it was before and it approximate upper limit of growth what is important also to uh, to discuss on this on this slide that uh, this logistic S curve usually represent the cumulative data. The cumulative data like population growth, like a uh, number of cars or number of kilometers uh, constructed and something, uh, something like that, or number of articles published. But at the same time, the growth process, and we already discussed this uh, within our course, can be also described with a bell-shaped curve which represent the rate of changes. And whatever system we take, whatever um, system or um, biological or technological or societal system uh, or political one, it always uh, starts to grow with a, a slow speed. After that, the speed of growth increase at a certain period of time, it starts to decrease. Even the cumulative growth continue, we continue to accumulate more and more uh, species or more and more participants on the market or more and more uh, technical devices on the market. The population can continue to grow, even the speed of growth and the bell shape curve represent more the changes of the speed of growth, rate of growth. So from practical point of view for strategic um, decision making about technological diffusion and the uh, growing of new technologies, we are going to use this curve 
And why we are going to use this term? Because through uh, many uh, years of observation, how different system grows and decline, the, those curve was reinvented uh, many times in different domain. In economic study, about uh, in biological study, about population growth or in a certain domain or even growth of individual uh, organism or individual technical system of performance growth. Those mathematical expression describe the real uh, process growth and decline much better than exponential one. So we are going, we are going to use this one uh, assume that is from one point of view most generic, from another point of view most exact. Yes, please. What is the question? Okay. Uh, question is uh, regarding um, two systems. Uh, say uh, one system um, depends on the other. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an example that I'm thinking of um, is the mobile phone and the camera. So when they were put together, uh, before they were put together, they were independent systems. So I, uh, I can imagine them, uh, you know, fitting onto this curve. But now that they're together, uh, does it make, does it one influence the other? Does it change anything in terms of uh, the population, the birth growth, maturity and aging itself? Will, will it make a difference? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question, because it helps us to disclose also that within a growing, within a growing, uh, the system, they when they arrive to the upper limit of growth, they continue the evolution by um, integration with another system. This was exactly uh, the question about the camera. If you look, for instance, uh, to the uh, process of growth uh, on the certain market of digital camera, okay. It was arrived to the plateau dozens of years ago. Okay, it did not continue to grow, but the number of cameras continue to grow as a part of uh, smartphones. And today in the smartphones, we can observe that we have not only one camera, but we have even two cameras, the front camera and back camera, which are different resolution. And in order to improve functionality, of back camera, for instance, in order to improve quality of images, we have also some kind of combination of two or three, uh, what can be named camera because those are the lenses and the sensors. So this is exactly how our system goes from one curve to another one and how they are substituted. And we will see it today, the, how can we use this uh, logistic S curve in order to describe and predict the substitution of one system by another one. But uh, the, the, the question when a uh, system arrived to the upper limit of growth, it continued its evolution as a part of another system. And this is a, one of the very fundamental law of uh, technology's evolution. But let us put a bit more detail about uh, logistic uh, curve uh, function and what can we learn for practice. In fact, the first time uh, this function was derived uh, by a Belgian mathematician in 1835, in the 19th century, after the study in economic, after the study about uh, growth of population in Europe. In fact, uh, this, this curve is based on uh, the following differential equation. When we describe the ratio between population over the time as, a, uh, as a, this differential equation. And uh, this differential equation can be uh, solved, one of, the, one of the solution, the following way. When the population over the time is represented as a ratio of upper limit of growth divided by one plus exp exp exponential in a, uh, in a this, uh, yeah, way. But let's see little by little the meaning. 
the anti on this uh, slide, this is a cumulative adoption function. It means the cumulative rate of growth, how it is, uh, cumulative uh, growth, how it is changed. When FT, this is a non-cumulative adoption, it means our bell-shaped curve. The key, this is an upper limit of growth, usually our system grow and never cross this upper limit of growth, it is substituted by another system. And in, for different systems, this upper limit can depend on different kind of limitation. Usually it is capped by available resources. The alpha, this is a, a growth rate parameter, which represent time required for growth trajectory within uh, this period of time from two to four. In fact, this is a time of exponential growth. And parameter B in this equation, better, I'm sorry, parameter better in this equation, this is a, a specific time, this is a midpoint of growth, when uh, we arrive to the population, which is a half of upper limit of growth. And usually it is uh, interesting to know this point because it indicates us very clearly the time, the time of growth when we arrive to the highest rate of changes. You see this point three on this diagram uh, correspond uh, to the highest rate of changes. The point one uh, on this on this diagram, this is a, a wall population. It means the capacity of the market. If we are talking about te uh, technology, this is a uh, when. The, our upper limit of growth is always the subset of this whole population. The point two, this is a lower threshold. In fact, the all invention, before they arrive to the innovation, they have to pass this um, so-called infant mortality threshold. Okay, usually it corresponds to the 10% on the market. And when system pass through this threshold, it starts to grow exponentially. And it is very interesting to predict this point. This is the lower threshold. The point three, this is exactly our the, uh, inflection point where our function of non-cumulative growth, rate of growth, okay, has its maximum value. This is a midpoint of growth. And the point four, this is an upper threshold after which our exponential growth change its nature and start and our growth continue non-exponential way uh, approaching our upper limit of growth. And usually when the system of business after this point, it has to change uh, the, the rules and policies which were used on the period of exponential growth. Otherwise, um, it will be not competitive. Because basically the curve that we are discussing now, we will see the basic assumption uh, just a bit later. This is a curve which represents the growth under the competition, the growth of system under the competition. So I would like just to say that very interesting to see that the history of this curve uh, is interesting because it was rediscovered so many times, even in different countries, it is named differently. For instance, in the US, it is named Pearl, Pearl Cor Curve because it was uh, discovered by, uh, by Mr. whose name is Pearl. In, um, um, it, it, is, it, it is named also Sigmoid Curve, S curve, it has many names for different domains because it was rediscovered. But what is interesting is that mathematically, finally, it is the same, the same function which represents the behavior of system when it grows.
when it grows under the competition? Well, let us see uh, for uh, what can we measure or what can we study with logistic S curve. Today, there are uh, so many, so many different applications that uh, we, we use this curve. Even the knowledge, your knowledge, is growing also logistically. Just recall your own experience when you started to learn foreign language. At the beginning, uh, you uh, spent a lot of time to memorize new words, but after that, the new words start to grow exponentially as soon as you become more or less familiar with uh, the new language, when at a certain point you didn't add too many words to your dictionary. And when we learn whatever we are learning, uh, this, is, this is also can be described logistic function. Or for instance, number of scientific publication, or number of smartphones on the market, or number of cars on the certain market, or number uh, of population, Population growth is also very well uh, described and predicted with uh, this, uh, this function. Uh, let me share with you a few examples. Um, and let's uh, discuss, discuss why this curve is so universal. For instance, the uh, size of uh, any plants which grows can be well predicted the maximum size can be well predicted when we have uh, several data points about the beginning of, of the growth. Why our sunflower does not grow taller? If you look to the process of growth, we will uh, easily arrive to the conclusion that it is always limited by available resources. For instance, if I take another example, which is uh, evolution of efficiency of different motors. Okay, we can see that uh, here we are not measuring population, but we are measuring efficiency, mechanical efficiency of different kind of motors. And we can see that when we substitute one motor by another one, we can see that each time the efficiency grows, which is, which is what is interesting that if you look it through the time, it grows according to the logistic S curve. On this diagram, the triangles, this is a prediction, and uh, the circle point, this is uh, the recent estimate of most advanced gas turbine. The next example of logistic S curve that I would like to share with you. This is, a, for instance, a prediction of a total production of fine copper in Chile. We took the data point, those red nodes, this is a data point when the curve is a prediction. And what we can learn, we can learn how the production of fine copper will grow in this particular country within a time. And when it will stop to grow exponentially it start to, and start to approximate. On the basis of this um, extrapolation, we can uh, build our strategic decision about technologies to use or not to use in mining industry and uh, how, how many uh, resources we will have in order to invest in our new technologies. Yes, please. So question is uh, um, regarding what we covered earlier um, uh, concerning the drivers and barriers. So is it reasonable to um, assume that uh, along this S-shaped curve, uh, when we go, uh, are we solving or uh, overcoming these barriers and that's why it moves along that, uh, that, that line? Is it a reasonable um, way to look at it? Yeah, yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for this uh, comment. Because in fact, uh, when uh, we said that our logistic curve described the process of competition of our system for the for the resources, 
the how we uh, bypass the different barriers okay uh, usually represented in more syn synthetic way by the trajectory of evolution of our system over the time and this is this is this is exactly but when we have a lot of uh, several barri barriers to see it's uh, from time to time it's difficult to synthesize uh, out of them trajectory but uh, the knowledge of barriers knowledge of problems allow us to understand what are the resources which are limit uh, the evolution of our system what are the resources which are limit efficiency of our motors what are the resources which are limited uh, which are uh, limiting uh, the production of fine copper it's not only explored uh, sources of fine copper it's also different kind of resources that can limit uh, another example that i would like to share with you is interesting to share because on the horizontal line you can see that we use not a time dimension uh, but we use kind of time series but in uh, in the horizontal line we have a cumulative research and development span uh, which is a constant to 2005 and what is interesting to see that if we have uh, this uh, kind of measurement and if we look how the efficiency of uh, our uh, energy uh, producing technology grows the uh, trajectory is also can be described by logistic S curve. On this diagram, you can see the pink point, those are the data point, and the um, blue one, those are the prediction using the logistic, the, the logistic function. And we can see that the prediction is very close to the data point. So we can, uh, we can use this model in order to predict how our efficiency of uh, wind energy by cumulative r d investments will increase in most of the cases we use the time as the expenses the time as expenses on on, on our logistic s curve but it can be also used not only time if uh, this is a regular regular changes according to the uh, regular intervals of the resource and very essential that this is a resource that we spend the time it is the most generic resource that we spend for evolution of any system so that's why in most of the cases we plot our logistic s curve in a time and we already discussed that for that we use time series but this as, as you can see through this example there are some exception from the rule from the rule what are the basic assumptions on which uh, our logistic S curve is based. Why it is so generic? Because if you look to the basic assumption, we can see that those basic assumptions can be applied not only for biological system, not only for uh, societal system, but also for the technical system. The first one, that the natural growth of autonomous system in competition might be described by logistic equation and logistic as curve. But if you look, essentially, whatever system we take, it grows always in competition. It, it grows always in a competition for certain resources. It can be resources of water, it can be resources of land, it can be resources of air, it can be resources as a market niche of clients, but it's always grows, the system always grows in competition. Uh, the next assumption that we use when we use a uh, logistic S curve, that natural growth is defined as an ability of species which are growing to multiply, to increase their numbers inside finite niche capacity. Niche capacity means upper limit of growth through the time period. Let us see uh, what, what what can be the example of upper limit of growth? For instance, if you're talking about uh, personal mobility, 
uh, technologies. And if we use, uh, for instance, um, motorbikes, which are uh, most uh, popular uh, technological solution in India for personal mobility, more than 80% of the market, okay, you cannot put on the streets more motorbikes than you have a space, right? You have to have a space. The same with the parking. You cannot park the motorbikes if there is no space. Even you can produce those motorbikes, you can stock them, and people can afford them to buy. They cannot use it if there is no space. So how the space is reducing within a time as more people are using, for instance, motorbikes, represent the trajectory of evolution, for instance, motorbikes on the certain, on the certain market. The niche capacity, this is an upper limit of groups. But watch out, do remember we're on, on our uh, slide about logistic escrow, we had a line number one. Line number one, this is an all available space, but all available space does not change a lot because we have to have available space for moving a big motorbike. You cannot use motorbike to move if you have no road condition. So we are talking about space, which is this, uh, representative for the road condition also. And the third uh, assumption that we use that for social technical system, the three parameters, as shape growth model can be applied for designing uh, trajectories of growth and decline through the time. In fact, there are many uh, different uh, mathematical expression which use not only three parameters, five parameters and more parameters, they uh, have more sophisticated nature and uh, they show in a very specific condition a higher accuracy of prediction. prediction. But we are going to use uh, the three parameters, simple logistic S-curve, which is a symmetrical according to the point uh, of inflection, point three, if you recall the diagram uh, that we uh, discussed just one slide before, uh, why? Because uh, this logistic S curve resolves uh, the trade off between simplicity of model and predictive capacity of the model. If we increase complexity of the model, we can achieve much more detailed results for more particular cases. But what we are looking for, we are looking the model which are generic enough and accurate enough to support strategic decision making. If you are interested about a uh, quantitative model at the end of uh, our today's session, we will share with you the list of the references. And uh, there are some books which are available even for free for, through the internet. But we are, we are going, in order of our course, we are going to use logistic as shaped growth model. Yes, please. What is your question? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for the example uh, from uh, Indian roads uh, that I understood for competition. Definitely, uh, not only motorbikes but also uh, you know auto rickshaws, the tuk tuks, um, and the other vehicles also compete for the same available space. So I understood the first assumption. Uh, can you or uh, can you? Uh, give us an example of the second assumption, the species. Uh, what, what do you mean by species uh, in, in this? I'm, I'm not able to relate to that. Uh, perhaps for an example? Yeah, let's us, let's us see, let's us see just next slide. Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for this question. Let's us, uh, let's us try to understand um, this question through the following example. For instance, if you put the question, what will be the number of passenger movement by roads in India in coming 10 years, okay? We have a population of the country. And uh, those population is moving within a, every day, the people move using the roads and using not only roads. But let us see what will be number of passengers which are moving by roads. 
Okay? By roads, this is an infrastructure which we don't include by railroad and we don't include by airplanes. Those are the people who are moving by the roads. And the species, those are our passengers. Our passengers, this is a population. And if you just look to the available data from Ministry of Road Transportation and Highway in India, we can see the following statistics. Okay, from 2001 until 2017, and this is in billion passengers per kilometer. It means in 2017, 17 trillion, 17.8 trillion passengers per kilometer moved within this year. Okay, this is a cumulative data. This is how it, it grows within a time. And it represents the mobility of people, the population grows, and mobility of people altogether. And if you try to use these numbers and uh, with our logistic curve in order to predict, for instance, how many uh, passengers per kilometer we will have in India in 2022, okay, we can arrive to the following result. We take data point, we try to fit those data point using logistic S-curve model, and to what we arrive? We arrive to uh, the conclusion that the upper limit of growth, the niche capacity, okay, for the road, for movement, of people by road in India is about 19.9 trillion. It means in the future, it will not bypass this upper limit of growth in the coming 10 years, even, even more years ahead. The midpoint of this growth using uh, this extrapolation is about uh, almost 2012. We shout, we are talking about financial years here, not uh, years in European calendar, financial years in India uh, start in April and finish in March. Okay. So in order to have approximation by months, we can be more precise. In 2012, we already reached the midpoint half of the niche capacity when the time of exponential growth is almost 16 years so 2012 plus eight years we arrived to the in 2020 we arrived to the end of exponential growth before uh, just bit at the beginning of 2020 we arrived to the end of exponential growth of uh, passenger movement by road in India. So we can answer, we can answer for the question with a high precision that in 2022, we will have about 19 trillion passenger per road in India. This is, this is how it works based on the data available. Yes, please, what is the question? Okay, the question is that uh, now uh, the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways uh, looks at this data uh, and, and a recommendation uh, for them say is, oh, uh, I'm going to build uh, more highways and more uh, roads because uh, now I, I can see that this is an opportunity to make, uh, to extend it to, um, you know, uh, to, to places where uh, roads weren't there, highways weren't there. Uh, will our prediction change or uh, or will it remain the same will will external conditions like this the environment changes like that will it uh, uh, make any changes in this or uh, uh, will it stay the same yeah it it it, it seems that uh, situation situation in india infrastructure of the road in india uh, the pattern of evolution uh, is uh, similar that we experienced in other countries and what, uh, what happened really, that in order to build new highways, we have to use 
the space. In fact, today the network uh, of uh, roads uh, in India, this is uh, um, uh, second largest in the world already. Okay. And uh, uh, if we try to build more roads, it means we are going to reduce the cropland. If we are going to reduce cropland, okay, we have less food. Or uh, if we are going to uh, build the more roads, we are going to uh, take another resources from another domains. So uh, what is interesting to see that with logistic S curve, even we don't know all the causes, even we don't know all the why it happens like that, we can catch the pattern. We can catch the pattern of evolution and we can uh, indicate the upper limit of groups. In order to answer for, this, uh, for the question of uh, Barla straightforward, uh, I would like to say that um, it is uh, very improbable that the uh, number of passengers movement by routes in India will uh, increase and will uh, will be more than uh, uh, 19, uh, 20, 20 trillion, 20 trillion, whatever year we are taking into account. The, because those are the competition. And uh, if, if you look, for instance, uh, if you try to uh, forecast uh, for, uh, to answer question for India's alternative markets, okay, we need to take, for instance, into account what are the uh, two wheelers uh, that passengers use, what are the three wheelers, and what are the four wheelers, okay, small and mid middle sized cars. And what is interesting to see that um, today, uh, according to the data, the two-wheeler sales uh, on the hand uh, share is over 80% of all vehicles which is used in India. It, it shows us that we already use uh, the existing infrastructure uh, very, uh, very efficient. If I compare, for instance, the same uh, situation with the European country where most of the vehicles, they are four wheelers, means the one vehicle take more space on the road. So uh, the logistic S curve, uh, they are kind of interesting models also because they touch essentially, essentially uh, the essential uh, limitations of any kind of growth. And those are the limitation of the resources the limitation of the resources under the competition. And so that's why they are so universal. Years ago, when I uh, started to use uh, those logistic curves in practice, I was really astonished how it is possible that they can be applied so universal. What is the, what is the root cause of the, of, uh, the models are so efficient and uh, they have so predictive power? In fact, because on the foundation of those models, the very basic uh, and generic uh, idea of limiting resources, which are changing within a time. So th for the prediction, this was okay, one of the best choices that I, I made. And uh, not only me, a lot of researchers around the world, they, uh, they receive very uh, successful and very credible result using this mathematical expression. Of course, uh, as any model, it has advantages and disadvantages. And one of the uh, problem when, for instance, I would like to see how uh, infrastructure of roads can be substituted by another infrastructure of transportation infrastructure. And if I start to compare the roads infrastructure with um, aviation, I can see that number of kilometers in aviation is uh, not two times higher, many times higher. And if I try to put them onto the same plot, it is very difficult to catch how the system substitute each other. So, but fortunately, from a mathematical point of view, those problems was already uh, resolved. And, uh, and I'm going to share with you 
uh, Fisher prey transform. And let us understand what does it mean and why it is uh, so interesting to learn. The Fisher prey transform, in fact, this is a kind of generalization of S curve model. If you look that to S curve model from a very generic point of view, okay, we have a upper limit of growth, which is on this diagram represent one. And we have time of exponential growth and midterm of growth. But if we fix the upper limit of growth, if you take it as a, not as a variable, but as a known, okay, we can transform our nonlinear function into the linear one. For instance, in this case, the, uh, the function uh, in, can, can be that ratio of our population changes within a time divided by upper limit to growth. And this function of time in Fisher prey transform, this is a ratio of this function of time divided by one minus function of time. What is interesting to see in this case, we arrive to the linear representation of the same growth process within the time, the time we don't change. And here we arrive not on the number of kilometers, for instance, or not on the number of passengers, but how the ratio of upper limit of growth of passengers to the present value of a uh, passenger per kilometer. For instance, if I take into account our example about um, mobility in India, okay, how it changed. One of the uh, main advantage, why do we use uh, this uh, fisher prey transform? Because uh, with the help of fisher prey transform, we can see how technology substitute each other. Let me uh, just give you an example in order to make to make clear how how it can be how it can be used this Fisher Prey transform. But before going uh, uh, the next uh, to present you example, I'd like just to repeat and to be sure that you really catch the main idea. In fact, we describe the same process of growth without any degradation of accuracy. The only difference we make transition from three parameters function to the linear function by assumption that our upper limit of growth is fixed. When upper limit of growth is fixed, we plot on this diagram how the ratio of population within a certain period of time uh, ratio between population of some period of time to the upper limit of growth. And we use this ratio in order to depict. Let's us see uh, how it works through the example. Let's us see uh, the history of uh, United States music recording media. But uh, I'm not going to show you the history up to now. I'm going to show you the history after 2004 with data which is available uh, just before 2000. If you look, uh, for instance, how the, uh, the market has been changed and when we measure it in millions of United States dollars in absolute values, okay, we can see that this is a market of vinyl, which was after that, we had a cassette, after that CD, and MP3. And before 2010, we had a kind of forecast on the basis of the data available up to 2004. But when we look to these absolute values, it is kind of tricky to forecast when the technology are substituting each other. It seems that they, they are coexisting. But if we take the same data through the Fisher-Prey transform and fit it logistically, we arrive 
to this model. On the vertical X, we have a ratio. It is not any more millions of dollars. We have a ratio according to the upper limit of growth. When on the horizontal one, we have a timing. What is interesting on this diagram, if the line is straight, it represents logistic S curve. When it is not straight, it is non logistic S curve. This is another, uh, another part of the model. The points, the different kind of, uh, they represent data when the lines uh, with uh, the same colors, they represent the model. Here we can see, for instance, within a time, the market share of vinyl decreased. And before 1985, precisely in 1984 in US market, it was a 50-50% with a cassette. When our CD and DVD, they started to grow somehow in 1985. Uh, please pay attention that uh, in the vertical axis we have a logarithmic scale. For instance, this line represents 10% of market growth. Do you remember our infant mortality threshold? When the one represents 50% of market and 100 represent the whole process of growth. What is interesting to see that uh, fisher prey transform allow us to point clearly how the technology compete on the market. For instance, if you are, I take the point in a time in uh, 1987, I can see that uh, in this very time, the CD and DVD and vinyl, they occupied uh, almost the same part of the market when the dominating technology was a cassette and they those technology took much more than 50 percent of the market and within a time we can see the substitution of different technology on this diagram in fact we have four technologies and how did they substitute each other within a time with a prediction which at those time for the uh, data available up to 2004 this was a prediction but in fact this was a reality how on the market of united states the downloadable digital music uh, share the market with the cd and dvd in 2005 and later on it started to grow yes please what is the question so the question is i understood the fisher pry uh, and how it comes about. Uh, we showed the uh, linear model. Uh, so the what was the nonlinear model became a linear model by uh, the formula. Uh, but uh, these two ones, uh, the the cassette uh, and the CD, seems to sort of bend about. Uh, how do we include that in the model? Uh, because if we were if I were, uh, I, I, I don't have much experience, let's say, with uh, mm -hmm. modeling this, I would just draw a straight line. I would have drawn two parallel lines like that, the blue line and the cyan line, and mm -hmm. uh, gone about it. I would never have done this curved part. So how, how do we do that? Yeah. In fact, uh, this bending part, this bending part represents exactly uh, the situation after our model arrived to the uh, saturation point uh, uh, when our technology arrived to the uh, maturity point and uh, stop its exponential growth and uh, stay on the plateau. Okay, it doesn't grow, but it does not decline. It starts to decline when the straight line appear. Within this bending point, our technology stay on the plateau. But why it is bending? In fact, because there are other technologies which participate in competition in the same time. Let us revise a bit more in detail the basic assumption about fisher prey transform in order to understand how, how, it, how it goes. In fact, the basic assumption 
uh, about fisher prey transform, they are the following. There are three basic assumptions. The first one, that the many technological advances can be considered as a competitive substitution of one method of satisfying a need by another. We can see the technologies, four technologies, but they satisfy the same need, okay, the same function. They provided access to the music, okay, to recorded music. Record and make it accessible, okay? We satisfy the need. And this is a part of the answer, how can we predict emerging technology? Because whatever technology we have, those technology, they will satisfy existing need. For instance, if we substitute uh, uh, transportation on the road by transportation by airplanes, the need is the same to move from one point to another one. So, uh, the one of the assumptions of Fisher Prey and a model for technology substitution that we, uh, whatever method we use, we satisfy a certain need. The second assumption is if a substitution has progressed as far as a few percent, it will proceed to competition, to completion. It means if our technology pass through the infant mortality threshold, it becomes competitive. If it does not pass, it, it, it does not participate in substitution process. It has to arrive to the certain uh, level of the, uh, on the market. And the third assumption that the fractional rate of fractional substitution of new for old is proportional to the remaining amount of the old left to be substituted. And this is exactly the explanation about this curved path. Because if you look carefully on the um, example that I suggested for your attention before, on the vertical X, this is a 100% of the market. And even market is growing, we keep is as, as a ratio. So this is why this is a 100% of the market. It is not absolute value of people who are listening in music. This is a 100% of overall market. So, so this is why the fractional rate of uh, fractional substitution of new method for old is always the ratio, the proportional to the remaining amount of the old left substituted. And this idea was first presented years ago by Fisher and Prey in, in their um, publication and simple substitution model for technological change, which uh, is a foundation of many, many interesting findings which were done later on. What is interesting to see that those models since those time was tested for many different domains, for many different industries, and they show very um, useful result for strategic decision making when we are talking about substitution. Let's us see how transport infrastructure can be, okay? We will see after answering the question, please, the question. Uh, no, this is a philosophical question. Uh, fisher Prey uh, model sounds dangerously close to Charles Darwin theory of evolution itself, where uh, it said how competition among many species uh, actually, and one of them uh, sort of prevails, uh, and rest of them are still sort of there, but eventually the one species wins. That's uh, as far as I understand about theory of evolution. So what is your opinion on that? So this is the, a philosophical question. Yeah, of course, of, of course, it, it has a lot of in common with evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. But what is interesting also to see that it was proved through the observation of hundreds of uh, examples and hundreds of substitution uh, process within a, within a time. Uh, yeah, this is how we, how we can perceive the results, the results of competition and the results of substitution. And uh, yes, of course, if you uh, just revise our basic 
assumption about logistic S curve, do you remember niche capacity species? And if we uh, just review uh, the basic assumption for Fisher prey model, it has a lot in the common with biological system. And this is how do we how do we learn about reality by observation of biological system, and after that we use the generalized model if they are relevant to uh, analyze diffusion diffusion of our technologies and to support our strategic decision about technologies in order to answer to the question to which technology we have to invest or to, from which technology we have to step out. Because for instance, if, if you look to the uh, slide that I'm sharing right now with you, this is a story of transport infrastructure in the United States with the data just up to 1988. And what is interesting to see that using a uh, logistic substitution model, which is based on the fisher prey transform, the uh, bold wavy curve, this is a data point, when a thin lines, those are the, the model. Okay, And uh, for different countries, the situation will be different. Here we can see for United States. And what we have are uh, small circles. Those are the data point after we use uh, available data up to 1998 to make pro pro projection. And if we, for instance, uh, need to take strategic decision in uh, 2010, for instance, in which infrastructure we are going to invest or for which infrastructure, transport, transportation infrastructure in the United States we have to step out, we can clearly see that the market share of the roads is going to decline when the market share of the airways is going to increase. It doesn't mean when it declines, it doesn't mean that the absolute value is going to decline. No, it can be, it can continue to grow, but much slower than, for instance, something for airways. And which is what is more interesting, even more interesting, with uh, those kind of models, we can predict when the next infrastructure is going to start to grow and how it is going to grow. And this is uh, something that we can uh, practice in order of advanced course and uh, that we are supposed to suggest after this introductory course that we uh, propose for your attention. Um, yes, please. <laughs> uh, a quick observation, uh, more than a question. Looks like uh, the influx, uh, the changeover point seems to be around 80%. Uh, is that um, safe to assume that after 2050, when the airways also sort of would uh, taper and, and turn around at around 80%? Is this naive or uh, is this uh, you know, science-based? Logically, no. Th this is uh, yeah. This is this is uh, this is uh, more or less uh, uh, relevant observation. Yeah, when we have a, a normally a two or three, not more, uh, competitive technology on the market, usually we have a one which are dominating one, and the second one which are on the decline. Okay. And when we are talking about three, we have a one uh, technology which is on the decline, one technology which is on the, on the growing. For instance, if I look to the situation 1960 for the transport infrastructure in the US, the roads, they were on the top. When airways started to grow and they start to bypass infant mortality, when the railways, infrastructure decline. Yeah, the observation more or less, but I don't want to, to generalize, is it 80% or is it 70%? It has to be, um, it has to be fitted. <laughs> let's take data, let's take time series, and let's see each time uh, in a particular case. Because if I, for instance, try to check this generalization according to our uh, music, uh, music, uh, sales in US, I can see that, for instance, the CD, they uh, were on the curve when they took 
Yeah, almost 85%. Okay. We have to we have to always to check it through the data. Because the idea, the main idea, we are interested to catch the pattern of evolution within a time. Well, in fact, if I try to sum up, we use uh, three, three main model in order to understand the evolution, in order to um, predict evolution with the help of uh, quantitative models. We use S-curve, which uh, represents the size of the growth, cumulative size of the growth, and anticipate the growth potential and the level of final upper limit of growth, and how much could one expect to accomplish. We use the bell-shaped curve, which represents the rate of the growth, how fast. With the bell shape, we can always uh, predict what will be the next year. Will it, will it increase or will it decrease the next year? And what is interesting that if you have a fit using logistic S curve, you have you can always make derivation of bell shape curve because those are represent representation of the same process. And the bell shape allow us uh, to know. Uh, the growth phases and how far one is from the end okay because the bell shape curve uh, represent clearly what will be the end of the story for the certain system and the fisher prey transform normalize each curve to the carrying capacity it means what according to the upper limit of growth what will be the evolution? And this is very useful because more than one logistic can be plotted in the same chart and they can be compared. Because th this is a ratio about carrying capacity about upper limit of growth. Uh, the bottom line of each slide, you have always uh, the source, the reference that you can uh, penetrate a bit more in order to uh, go in deep about what we are talking within our within our presentation, but let me uh, discuss a bit about uh, the pitfalls and difficulties. And for that, uh, this is uh, something that I'm going to share with you. This is a problem which is common for any kind of quantitative models. Uh, which use extrapolation of data point. And in fact, the more data point we have, the more accurate prediction we can obtain. Let's us see through this video, uh, which is uh, built for 95% confidence interval. And we have a variable in a gray. It means the result of our feed. When we, we change a number of data points, and when the number of data points is small, we have very big area gray. But the more we increase the number of data points, the more accurate prediction we can obtain. And the black one, this is a data points available. When the gray one, this is what is predicted. Let's just see it once again. At the very beginning, when we have a not enough data point, our prediction is not so accurate and valuable. But as, as we increase the number of data points, the accuracy of prediction increases. Out of this, we can draw a kind of generic um, conclusion that if you use logistic S curve for forecasting, the minimum number of data points has to be 12. Why 12? Because we are talking about uh, three parameters um, equation. And if you have just six data point, the accuracy of your prediction will be really questionable. Because for the six data point, three parameters mathematical function can produce very good fit, but this uh, fit will not be 
uh, how to say this, reasonable and interesting at all from point of view of reliable for recasting. The more data point you have, the more accurate result with a quantitative method and in particular with logistic S-curve we can achieve. So the one of the drawback we have to find data point. But what is a good idea, we can collect data point about previous generation of technology. So that's why we always start with definition of what is the main function of our technology, what kind of need our technology satisfies. If I just try to see um, another limitation which arrive on the discussion with the forecasting approaches and strategic decision making, they can be grouped by uh, quantitative and qualitative methods separately. In fact, we have a, a lot of uh, quantitative approaches. They are well representative, they are well described, well studied, and uh, widely applied. But they are widely applied for operational and short term decision making for tactical decision making and but they are they have very limited uh, application for strategic decision why because quantitative method usually can show us when our system arrived to the uh, plateau of uh, their development but they cannot answer what will be the next one what are the features of the next system okay we can compute when aviation when airplanes will arrive to the plateau, but what will be the next transportation means which will be used? What will be the next uh, transportation infrastructure? For that, we use normally qualitative methods, and uh, the qualitative method like Delphi survey and the other judgment methods, they are also widely applied for forecast. Uh, to forecast in innovative changes, but they, they have limited uh, ability to answer for the question when and where. For instance, a lot of people are talking about 3D printing, but in order to answer the question when 3D printing will be the dominant technology for manufacturing in India, with the qualitative methods, we cannot answer. Okay, the general idea is let us combine two methods, quantitative and qualitative, in order to arrive to, to the clear answer for supporting strategic decision making about uh, technology management. Yeah, and there are a lot of approaches which suggest those combinations. But those approaches are facing with the following problem. In fact, in fact, those approaches are limited by uh, human being capacity. Human being capacity, uh, like information processing capability, how much information in which uh, time is possible to, to uh, treat, and which is much more difficult to bypass. This is a cognitive biases and beliefs. Cognitive biases and beliefs, this is something that really hide from us the future. And we need to have some methods and some resources to bypass our cognitive biases and to bypass our beliefs, because uh, our beliefs plays with us very, uh, very tricky uh, game. In fact, our beliefs, they uh, limit what we can see even we see but we don't believe in this in this situation we don't see what is well presented to us so those are the uh, difficulties that we uh, need to find a way methodological systematic way how to bypass when we try to forecast technological evolution from strategic point of view for strategic decision making which is from one point of view has to be long term from another point of view, has to be very precise to answering question what will happen, when and where. With a qualitative method, we can answer what, but we, we are always interested from business perspective, from uh, strategic decision, when and where. 
So those are uh, limitation. Another limitation uh, can be uh, regarded from different kind of activities. If you look to the advantages and limitation of qualitative and quantitative method, but from point of view of different kind of activities, we can see that they have different pro and con. Because if you are looking for the forecasting from point of view of design of new system and inventive problem solving, okay, the qualitative method, they are simple to perform, not necessary to take data, but they are very ambiguous of definition. And the results are highly biased. But if you are talking about designing new system, quality, uh, quantitative methods like logistic SQL, they the main advantage, they have clear definition of features and values for the improvement, but how to measure the new quality? How to measure what is not still exist? From decision making and management uh, of innovation point of view, the qualitative methods, which are so soft, I mean, which are based mostly on the judgment, they have low resistance for implementation, okay, easy to implement, but how to position the innovation in time and space, or in time or in the market, and in the competitive environment, because they have to be measurable. When the quantitative uh, method in, in such a situation for decision making, they, the, main, uh, the main advantage, they uh, provide results which seem plausible, plausible for decision making, but the efforts for data gathering, refining, and meaningful interpretation of results are really enormous. And if you are talking from perspective of long-term forecasting of technology change, the soft method, they're compatible with long-term forecast. It means they can be used in order to predict new qualities, to describe what kind of transportation will be after the aviation, but they are not accurate for predicting time and market. And the results, they, they depend on the panel of experts. They are highly biased. When uh, quantitative methods in such situation, the results are measurable, process is repeatable, adaptable. Okay, we can arrive to the um, reproducible results, but the problem is they are based on the past data and trends. And uh, in this case, we have indirect biases and computational models and assumption of the data. And if you look, for instance, 50 years prediction of uh, energy technologies, uh, which uh, was perfectly done with logistic substitution model, we can see that some derivation recently appear last 10 years, just because we have a new players on the market, which at those time did not play so much role. So the quantity quality. Um, if you are interested about uh, the topic that we discussed today, a logistic earth curve and quantitative methods um, of uh, forecasting, we suggest for your attention the following uh, references, which is nice that, for instance, the book, which is a third line in our list, is freely available in the internet. You can use this link to go and to read this book where you can find a lot of different quantitative models and you can uh, really go in deep on the subject how to forecast using uh, quantitative methods of forecasting. Um, quick uh, comment from my side is, uh, uh, I, you know, for learners is when they look at qualitative and quantitative, um, we feel, oh, which one do I choose? The, the answer is really uh, use the combination, which is what we have prescribed in our entire course, 
is we do the quantitative as well as the qualitative and uh, both go hand in hand uh, so to me that is the exciting part of trying to combine the two uh, effectively uh, and and make sense of it and be uh, sure of it so that that's uh, for me my personal favorite uh, in trying to combine these two and making sense of the data itself thank you so much uh, yeah uh, exactly exactly bala for strategic for strategic decision making there is no other choice we have to combine this which is qualitative forecast puzzle assemble the puzzle with a measurable when absolutely. this puzzle will take place absolutely yeah pictorially <laughs> well conveyed yes <laughs> yeah. thank so, you thank you very much and thank you for your attention see you for the next part of our course see you next uh, module Yeah.